As uh, Heather indicated, we're following along in Pastor Al's uh, pattern. And uh, we're continuing this journey that's going through Genesis. Our first two, uh, or our two lessons for this morning are probably the two best known of the stories about Abraham. The first is this call of Abraham out of Haran. It's a story that we celebrate. It's one that I have to say over over 35 years as a, as a minister, I probably use this story at least once a year going along. This story, this call of Abraham, it's, a, it's one of those fundamental, foundational stories for the Christian church. It's a significant story, a powerful story. It's a story of faith and, and how we as God's people are called to walk by faith. The second story, the story of the call to sacrifice Isaac at Mount Moriah, that's one of those stories that we tend to, well, we sort of tiptoe around it. We whisper about it, we wonder about it, we worry about it. Well, what was God doing? What was Abraham doing? But that too is a story of faith. And it's a call to walk by faith. The story in Genesis 12, well, that gets the whole Abraham cycle of stories going. The Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your people and your father's household to the land that I will show you. This is a story about new beginnings and risks. It's a story about stepping out in faith and trusting in God. It's a story about faith and the faithful one. Go from, that means leave behind your country, your people, your father's household. Leave behind all that is familiar, your place in the world, your safety net and your security. Leave it all behind and trust in me. Walk with me to my country. Allow me to use you to start my people. Embrace me as your father. Put your trust in me, God says to Abraham, and I will lead you on this incredible journey of faith to which nothing can compare. As you walk with me out into the unknown, the story begins, God does not give Abraham a set of coordinates to punch into his GPS. He doesn't give him a map and say, this is where you're going. All God does is invite him to follow and to trust and to believe. And God promises Abraham that he will be richly blessed if he does follow. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great among all of the people and I will bless those who bless you and everyone who curses, I, curses you, I will curse. All the people of earth will be blessed through you. Sounds great. It sounds fantastic. But as the journey begins away from all that is familiar, that's when things start to get interesting. Now, all of a sudden, Abraham has to live by faith. He can't trust in the old ways and what he's always done before. Now he has to actually get in the wheelbarrow and go across where God's going. Corey Tenboom made a, an acrostic out of the word faith, and she said, faith is fantastic adventure in trusting Him, Him of course being God. And, and, and that's what we're about as a faith community, we're trusting God. Walking by faith means living all of life, trusting in God. Trusting that He is both faithful to His Word and also that God is competent to do what is promised. There's a lovely old story that's told by uh, uh, Keith Miller and Bruce Larson in their book, The Edge of Adventure. And, and in the story they say that this, uh, there was a, uh, 
and note a lever that was found in this baking powder can it was wired to the handle of a water pump and it offered drinking water, or hope for drinking water, on this very long, seldom used trail through the desert in Nevada. This is what the note said. This pump is all right as of June 1932. I just put a new sucker washer into it. It ought to last five years. But the washer dries out, and the pumps got reprimed. Under the white rock, I buried a bottle of water. Out of the sun, cork end up. There's enough water to prime the pump, but not if you drink some first. Pour about a quarter in and let it soak to wet the leather. Then pour the rest in medium fast and pump like crazy. You'll get water. The water has never dried up. Have faith. When you get water, fill the bottle and put it back just like you found it for the next fella. Sign Desert Pete. P.S. Don't drink the water first. Prime the pump and you'll get all you can hold. That takes a bit of trust, doesn't it, when you're walking through the desert and you're dry? Well, walking out of the familiar was what was required of Abraham if he was to be the father of the faithful. He had to risk. He had to risk that the pump would produce water, that God would do what God had said he would do. And it led him on an adventure that does last his whole lifetime. But the second lesson for today, when we read it, we, we almost think it, it sounds cruel. How could, how could God make such a request of Abraham? Sacrifice your son? I mean, all of Abraham's hopes and dreams are all tied up in Abraham, or, or in Isaac, I mean. Now, Scott Sorcey has suggested this second lesson that we read this morning, this second lesson serves as the, the climax for a series of stories that goes on, and it could be called the education of Abraham. Ever since his initial calling in chapter 12, God has been leading Abraham along. You know, Abraham is supposed to trust in God and follow along. Now, if you look at those stories, if you go back home today and for your afternoon reading, you can read from chapter 12 to 22 and keep going. But, but as you go along, as you read through, what you discover is that there's this grim consistency in these stories. Abraham has repeatedly failed in the various tests that God has put to him. Twice he's passed off Sarah as his sister, so he wouldn't get killed. As he's gone along, this, this promise that God has, has uh, given to him that he would be the father of many nations, well, he, he keeps getting impatient. It's not happening. There's, if this isn't working, and, and his patience wears significantly, uh, or sufficiently thin, so that he starts to decide, well, he knows better than God, he can make alternative arrangements. You know, a couple of concubines, a wife, another wife. Abraham and Sarah both, at different times, left at God's promise. And when Isaac is finally born, what do they do? Well, they banish Ishmael and Hagar out into the wilderness to die. This is faithful Abraham, right? But as you go through the stories, what you see is that Abraham has been growing and maturing through the course of these chapters. And so when we get to chapter 22, literally the, the Hebrew says, after these things God tested Abraham. 
after these things? What things? Well, you could say everything that has transpired since chapter 12. This whole story, all of this testing, this education of Abraham. An Old Testament scholar, Ellen Davis, has suggested that with those words, after these things, you can discover that they also apply to everything else that we've read right from the beginning of Genesis. The first 11 chapters as well. Everything that Al has been talking about for the whole summer, after all of these things, there has been a, a steady movement right from the beginning of the people away from God. They haven't been following God, but they've been turning their back on God instead. And now Abraham stands before God and he is challenged to put his trust completely in God. To walk by faith trusting that God is good. Go to Mount Moriah and sacrifice your son. And the journey on foot gives Abraham a few days to think about what's going on here. Time to worry and time to reflect. But this time, Abraham passes the test. You heard the story, the knife is stopped, the ram is provided by God, and Isaac is spared. Now, you've got some homework. You have to go back home and read through Genesis 22 again. But what you, what you want to discover is something that Scott Posey points out to, to at least me, and, and I think to all of us, it says, as you... As you read through this 22nd chapter of Genesis, what's really striking is it doesn't deal with any of the kinds of questions that we want to deal with when we're reading from that story. I mean, the author not only doesn't seem to be, he's, he's not only aware of how tough this test is, and far from trying to, to nuance the command of God to Abraham, the author seems to be crafting the text, the text in such a way that it's very sharp, and very much sharpening the focus on what is being said, what is being asked, asked what we find so unacceptable. The hammering phrase in, in the whole of the story, your son, your only son whom you love, makes the story almost heartbreaking to read. And here I am sending you home to read it on a Sunday afternoon in the summer, right? Go and read it because it's this powerful story. When we read through this story of the, the binding and the near death of laughter, that's what Isaac means. When you read that, you normally read it if you're following along in the lectionary lessons in the season of Lent. So every three years, the scholars decided we need to read this story and we need to read it in the season of Lent, coming up to Good Friday and Easter. This story is just filled with foreshadowing. What do we hear? God himself will provide. With the sacrifice. It rings out. It rings out as, as we hear this story. And this is actually a story that's filled with hope as we journey. And it's also a story that provides a very early biblical clue that, that the elimination of evil is not going to be easy. The elimination of evil or the confrontation with evil is going to take enormous effort and sacrifice. Salvation is going to be a very costly enterprise. That phrase rings out. Your son, your only son whom you love. And what happens is we journey toward the cross looking to the cross and, and what happens God does provide let me tell you one more story another old story you've probably heard it at some point that 
maybe Al or, or Lonnie or, or John Jennings is, is, is old enough so that you could have heard it from any of these guys easily at some point. But it, it's a story that takes place during the, the bombing of London during the Second World War. And during the, the days of the Blitz, when, when Germany is really dropping bombs in the city of London, almost non-stop, a, a father is in a building with his son, and, and a bomb is dropped, and it strikes the building, and they, they have enough time to get out of the door, and, and they run out into the front yard, and there's already a shell hole in, in the, the street in front of them. And the father jumps down, and he, he holds up his arms, calling for his son to jump. But the son can't see him. He can't see him. He's too deep in this shell hole that already exists in the floor. And, and, and the father tells him, jump, and he says, I, I can't see you. The father looks up against the sky. And there he sees his son lit by the red of the burning buildings, and he says, John, I can see you. And the boy jumps because he trusts his father. Christian faith enables us to move through life. The Christian faith enables us to encounter death, not because of what we can see, but because of the certainty that we are people who are seen by a loving God. We don't know all the answers, but we are known by a God who knows us with all of our faults and all of our failings. Something's not working. But still God loves us. That's the good news. Now it's your turn to go and share that good news and that love and forgiveness of God with others. That's how the story spreads. Go and tell it. Amen. Please join with me in the prayer. Great and gracious God, we thank you that you had walked with Abraham when Abraham was both faithful but also when he stumbled. And you walk with us when we are a people who are celebrating our faith and how much we trust in you, but also you walk with us when we stumble. And you lift us up just as you lift Abraham up. And you walk with us in the journey of life. Give us eyes to see how you have called us and challenged us to be a people who embrace the people around us who need your helping hand. When we pray for others, help us to realize that most often we are the agents who can help. Your agents, your people, set in this place and in this time to accomplish your purposes. Guide and direct us as we seek to live for you as a church and as individuals. We pray at this time and remember those who are part of our circle of family and friends who are wrestling with illness, those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. We pray for those who are enjoying the, the summer months of rest and relaxation. Help them to be refreshed. And we, we think of Pastor Al and his family. Help them to be nourished. So they prepare to come back and, and serve in our midst. To walk with us in this journey of faith and life. All of these things we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ, your Son, your Son whom you loved, who dies for us to give us life eternal, and lives for us to give us hope. Amen.